So today, as uh, Carl mentioned, I'd like to talk about some work I did while at the EPSRC, Liverpool Centre for Mathematics and Healthcare at the University of Liverpool. And as you mentioned, yes, this was originally scheduled to be delivered in person in Manchester in March 2020. But um, yeah, well, we all know what happened there. Uh, and this was actually before the creation of this Northwest Seminar Series, which is pulling together um, people from Manchester, Liverpool and John Moore's Maths uh, Bio Seminars. So apologies if this presentation is already familiar to some Liverpool and John Moore's folk. I may have given it or something very similar to you guys before. <laughs> Um, but I've since left academia, as Carl mentioned, and joined the global agrochemical company Syngenta. And I'll hopefully have some time to talk a bit about this career change and how our mathematical skills that we all have can be very useful for the ag chem industry. So let's start by introducing the problem of the original research project. Uh, it was conceptualized by a collaboration with a very familiar name these days, the pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca. They wanted to know how mathematical modeling could help them learn more about modern 3D in vitro systems that are used in the lab. So in particular, we focused on 3D liver steroid assays. Now during drug development, new candidates must be tested for toxicity and efficacy in the lab with isolated cells before we get to clinical trials. And the chief regulator of drug metabolism in most cases is the liver. And so it's important to understand how new drug candidates interact with liver cells, otherwise known as hepatocytes. Now, liver models can range in complexity from your simple monolayer cell line assays to primary cell liver slices and organ on a chip technology. And with this incre increasing complexity comes increasing physiological relevance, but also increased costs, uh, increased difficulties in, in using this technology and the expertise required. <clears throat> uh, and potentially also increased uncertainty about how best to interpret and apply uh, these more complex yet more relevant bits of tech. And so the 3D spheroid culture system represents something of a nice intermediate that offers more relevance, but it's still relatively amenable to consistent and high throughput screening. So whereas 2D monolayer systems tend to be less relevant to in vivo scenarios as the um, the cell morphology is different, cells become flattened with minimal cell-to-cell -cell contacts, and all the cells are essentially exposed to a uniform culture environment. With 3D steroid cultures, they exhibit improved morphology and even improved cell functionality, so the expression of some relevant enzymes and proteins within the cells is better just simply being cultured in this three-dimensional conformation. And as well as What's crucial is that they provide the establishment of these physiologically relevant chemical gradients, um, for example, oxygen and nutrients, and a test compound of interest when you dose in these steroids with your drug. So in 3D, the problem is the interactions between the drugs and the cells remains relatively poorly understood. It's not as easy to model as with the monolayer situation. And what industry and pharma companies want to really know is how best to dose these liver steroids with new candidates which they're trying to test to see if they're toxic or not. How do they ensure that delivery goes right throughout the steroid so that you're not only testing the cells on the outside and how to improve therefore the distribution throughout the steroid. <clears throat> Our project proposes to use mathematics in order to get some enhanced mechanistic understanding um, by using underlying physical processes and then predicting how dynamics can change based on different chemical properties. So seeing how the chemistry of the drug uh, in, informs the spatial temporal dynamics. So we began by considering a multi-scale model that captures the spatial temporal dynamics of drug concentration within an in vitro spheroid. This model is composed of a micro scale model that considers the processes at the cellular level such as the cell membrane, membrane transport, and then a macro scale model, which is concerned with the arrangement of cells within the tissue. And so first off, we'll begin with the micro scale. So a cell membrane comprises of a phospholipid bilayer, and this is a hydrophobic protective barrier for the cell. And this property of the membrane is a key determinant in the effective permeability of any drug or chemical. <clears throat> 
such that it's lipophilic substances, i.e. substances which are more lipid soluble, that can more readily penetrate this barrier. Hydrophilic substances require specific transporters in order to get through. And for the study today, I'll be referring to two main types of transport. That's passive diffusion, which we define as the drug entering cells down a concentration gradient directly through the membrane, or carrier mediated transport, which is entering cells via specific transporter proteins, which are embedded in the plasma membrane. And this could be a passive or an active process. So in the microscale model, this investigation, we model an individual cell as an idealized sphere and assume that within the in vitro environment, drug transport is governed by diffusion processes. And we assume that diffusion can occur at different rates depending on whether you're inside or outside the cell and that the drug is metabolized within the cell only with some michaelis menten kinetics. So that leads to the following PDE equations, it's, uh, relatively simple reaction diffusion equations. Inside the sphere, we have processes of diffusion and metabolism. And we can do some scaling in this initial preliminary investigation just to reduce the number of parameters while we're considering the sensitivity to certain processes. So that's just dividing through by the characteristic length scale, which is the radius of the cell, capital R, and a characteristic diffusion time as well. So it's just two equations, or other one for the media or anything outside of the cell, that's just a diffusion equation. <clears throat> And D here represents the ratio between the two different diffusion coefficients, depending on which um, median you're in. We can further simplify this problem to 1D by assuming that we have radial symmetry and converting to spherical coordinates. So now we just consider the spatial dimension, uh, the radius, little r, and write the problem as such. So we got it in 1D, and we're just looking bigger. Uh, bigger than one or less than or equal to one, which is our rescaled cell radius. To impose the following boundary conditions for the center of the cell and some distance away from the cell with prescribed far field concentration. Uh, so that's zero flux at the cell center and then a fixed concentration of drug. And assume that the flux at the sphere boundary is equal such that mass is conserved. So we have this matching flux. Um, just to make things sensible. <laughs> and then for our basic PDE model, we can assume that concentrations are also matched at this cell media interface at the cell boundary, which is represented here in, in this um, repeating GIF animation by the dashed black line at R is equal to one for our 1D representation. Um, we can run some simulations if we initially assume that there's zero drug everywhere except from this constant supply at the outer far field, uh, which is R equals 10 here. And as time evolves, the drug diffuses into the media and the cell until a steady state is reached as the processes of supply and removal via this metabolism term uh, reach equilibrium. So note that so far we have neglected any potential effects of the membrane of the cell. We have just a, a matched concentration uh, at R is equal to one. Um, but this isn't necessarily the case. <clears throat> If we relax these assumptions, we need another condition at this boundary in order to determine unique values for the concentration at this value, whether you're on the cell side of the membrane or you're on the media side. And this is particularly relevant for some chemicals more than others, depending on, as I touched on before, their, their unique properties for determining how they cross cell membranes. And we can introduce a new boundary condition, which assumes that the internal flux at the boundary is proportional to the difference between the concentration of the chemicals across this boundary. And you could you can derive this by uh, considering explicitly a third compartment, this membrane compartment, which is really thin compared to the other two. And if we just assume that there's some diffusive process also going on between there. And you can derive your permeability coefficient, which we call Q here, which would be proportional to the diffusion within that membrane and the thickness of that membrane. But it simply comes down to a diffusive process to a proportional to a concentration gradient. Now, if we include this new boundary condition with permeability coefficient Q, we can investigate the sensitivity of the spatial temporal dynamics to this new parameter. So we can see the impact of the membrane barrier on the steady state for this passively diffusing drug. 
And for low permeability, low Q, that's represented by the blue profiles, there's a great discrepancy between drug concentrations either side of the cell media interface. Uh, for high permeability, this difference is reduced. So that's these uh, orange and red lines. And at the limit, we'd, re we'd reobtain this previous solution, whereby the, the membrane doesn't provide any kind of barrier. So it's only small lipophilic drugs that enter the cell via diffusion directly through the membrane. Other drugs rely on carrier proteins because uh, they don't have the right phys physical chemical properties. These drugs depend on carrier protein and um, the properties of these carrier proteins, and therefore this process can also become saturated. So it's a bit more complicated, requires a bit more of a complicated model. Um, so whereas previously we've got this uh, lacto diffusion case where the drug just diffuses directly through the membrane, if we're considering the carrier-mediated transport form, we need to include this process, which is the binding of the substrate chemical to the transporter proteins, and also a conformational change whereby the bound um, receptor changes direction in order to um, release the chemical or the drug into the cell. So this can be captured with a, a simple carrier model. And this describes the processes of transport and binding and that conformational change across the membrane. And we have used a simple carrier model, which is can be found in this uh, publication by Brian Wood and Steve Whitaker from 1998. You can look in there for more details. But essentially, this is just a, a, a representation of that cartoon schematic I showed, where you just have um, first order kinetics for all these different reactions. That's the binding and the unbinding and the conformational change. Um, assume a fixed total concentration of transporters that can exist in these four states, depending on whether they're bound or unbound and which conformation they, they're in. And then again, we want to get this matched flux boundary condition. So putting that all together, assuming some quasi steady state uh, approximations, you can finally end up with your flux, which is now proportional to the fixed total concentration of these transporter proteins, uh, as well as the concentration gradient in these alpha parameters, which are just different uh, combinations of these first rate parameters. So the reliance on the transporter proteins to state the is unsaturable with an explicit dependence on the surface area concentration, binding affinities and activity of transporters in the cell membrane. Sorry, Joe, just getting a bit distorted sound though. I don't know if it's just when you leaned away from the mic. Uh, okay, if that continues to be a problem, let me know and I can change microphone. It seems okay again now, it was very brief. Okay, thanks. Yeah, just let me know. Um, so here we can see, see via a suitable parameterization the possibility for mod modeling active uptake processes. Um, for example, if our alpha one parameter is less than one, the drug can be transported against the concentration gradient. So this could represent an active transport process. For example, if the binding affinity in the exterior is higher than the interior binding, or, or many different ways in which you could represent active transport based on that previous carrier model. Now, at the macro scale, we wanted to investigate the impact of multiple discrete cells within a, a realistic spherogeometry. Uh, replicating the in vitro environment we see in the lab. This was achieved with the help of our experimentalist collaborators at the University of Sheffield, as well as the pharmacology department at the University of Liverpool, who provided imaging data for hepatocyte spheroids in the form of uh, immunohistochemical staining and transmission electron microscopy. We used images of hepatocyte spheroids to identify realistic spheroid size and shape and the approximate arrangement of the cells by recording nuclei location data. So this was done manually and imported into MATLAB. This process would be more efficient in the future if it were to be automated, but this proof of concept work in this project only looked at one representative spheroid, so it was okay for this. Um, the spheroid we looked at here was of average size compared to all the others and included this interesting characteristic, which was common to all of them. Um, where the cells 
at least the nuclei you can see tend to be bunched up a bit more closely together at the outer edge. It's not quite as uh, uniformly distributed as you might expect. So this kind of geometry is an example of something that would likely be missed in more theoretical modeling exercises without the input of uh, imaging data. Uh, to approximate cell membrane boundaries, we use Voronoi tessellation. Uh, Voronoi tessellation, for those who haven't used it before, draws perpendicular bisectors between each node of the network or cell nucleus of the spheroid in our case. And this results in the generation of regions or cells such that at any point in the space in, in that cell is closer to its respective nucleus than to any other neighboring nucleus. And, and this is what it looks like when, when plotted in that one. And this form of tessellation is deemed a reasonable approximation for cells of this size, at least, and this type that are closely packed together and in, in an accepted application in the field. Exemplified here by a paper which is comparing Voronoi tessellation with some stained membranes. And it looks okay. Got a question in the chat, by the way, Joe. I didn't check if you want. Uh, do you want to? Oh, yeah. Do you see that? Go or? ahead. Uh, so it's uh, from Norman. It just says, uh, this assume does this assume no adsorption of the drug on the external surface of the plasma membrane? Absorption. So um, absorption with a D. All uh, the drug is accounted for. So because we've got that conservation of mass, so yeah, it'll either be out inside or outside, because we're not considering an explicit representation of, of the membrane. So no. <laughs> yeah. Um, Joe, Joe, that is a common assumption. Um, I, I'm not criticizing you for doing something unusual, but I have my doubts about that in some specific circumstances. But you, you've done you've done the normal thing. <laughs> no, at this point now it's worthy of discussion. Yeah, and it is something you could include if I kept that explicit representation of the cell membrane rather than making the assumption to simplify our boundary condition for sure. So that would be interesting to see how much an impact that has. Yeah, thanks for the comment. Um, okay, so we've got our cell nuclei in arrangement. We've got our cell membranes. Now we want the intercellular spaces. So the cellular ultrastructure was visualized by transmission electron microscopy. This, this uh, image is in the bottom left, you can see here. Revealing that the space between hepatocytes in this form was quite narrow between 0.1 and 0.5 microns, um, which is supported by the literature, which gives a range of spaces, to be honest, from the nanometer, hundreds of nanometer scale to the micron scale. Um, so we replicated this in our in silico version by contracting the vertices of each of our cells towards the center of mass. We use uh, ComSol multiphysics in order to solve the multi-scale model PDEs so now that we can put our solar geometry into this software, which is a finite element software, very useful for this kind of thing. The 2D spheroid slice geometry was imported and the PDEs were defined as before. So whereas we had um, our idealized single cell situation, now we've got these same sort of equations, but within this more realistic geometry. So each cell has the diffusion and the metabolism as before, and um, we're not using non-dimensionalization anymore. Uh, but the actual parameter values to make it more physiological. And then diffusion elsewhere, so that'd be representative of media or, or extracellular matrix, et cetera. And the boundary conditions, as before, um, I'm looking at the passive diffusion case here. You can just as easily, well, not just as easily, you can apply the transporter case as well, but you just need to be able to justify your parameters. So there's quite a lot more parameters when we consider the transporter case. So that might be more useful if you're looking at more bespoke modeling for a chemical specific situation. But for now, we're looking at the simpler passive diffusion case to consider a wider range of drugs and the general impact of permeability. So this is what a simulation run to steady state looks like in our console setup. We see once again, the establishment of a gradient where the drug concentration is relatively high in the outer media and then decreases towards the spheroid center. And a 1D cross section, so this is taken, say, from here, the center of the sun is going out towards the edge, uh, highlights those discontinuities in drug concentration with these jaggedy edges, um, which is representative of the concentration in the cells and in between the cells. 
during the process of model parameterization, which unfortunately I've had to skip for time purposes here, we noted that the chemically relevant variations in the diffusion coefficient uh, based on the literature have little impact on the overall spatial temporal dynamics. However, permeability, which is determined by the chemical lipophilicity of the drug, this lipid soluble property is much more important. Um, we investigate the sensitivity of this property with three hypothetical example compounds. So you might see log D7.4. This is essentially representing lipophilicity of the drug and therefore the degree of membrane permeability for the passive diffusion scenario, which we are currently considering. So a higher log D7.4 means higher lipophilicity and higher permeability, or at least at the individual cell level. So for highly lipophilic drugs, such as those that have this particular value, the cell membrane does not represent a significant barrier to drug penetration. There is relatively little difference between drug concentrations in cells and the intercellular space. For relatively lowly lipophilic drugs, the membranes do represent a significant barrier. Drug concentration is very low within the cells, but relatively high in the intercellular spaces throughout the spheroids, the red high, blue low. However, in the intermediate case, there is relatively little drug in the spheroid center, these blue cells, both inside and outside the the hepatocytes. So even before when we had a very lowly lipophilic drug, we had very high intercellular concentrations. And it's the balance between these overall processes of drug transport towards the steroid center, that's the diffusion, the permeability across the membranes, metabolism within the cells, uh, all contributes to impact in the penetration potential of the chemical. Thus, to summarize here, that quite intuitively, the intracellular concentration generally decreases with decreasing lipophilicity and thus decreasing membrane permeability. However, the intercellular concentration, i.e. the drug concentration between the cells, exhibits a non-monotonic relationship such that the minimal value exists for some intermediate value of lipophilicity. And we wanted to know what impact could this potentially interesting property have. So we investigated the impact of varying lipophilicity on drug delivery and its uptake further by considering a single discrete dose and measuring the rate of metabolism. So up until now, we've just considered a constant supply of external dose and looking at the steady state. Now we're considering a, a single given dose that will deplete over time. So to investigate drug delivery via metabolism, we introduced the following metabolism variable M, and that has the following dynamics. This is just the same Michaelis Menten term. So we're essentially just recording how much has been metabolized in the cell, corresponding to an accumulated drug metabolized. So this equation is obviously only relevant to, to those parts of the space which are identified as cells. Corresponding model simulations are conducted with this finite bolus dose, initially supplied in the outer medium. Uh, which is uniformly distributed in an extracellular space. It's like you put your spheroid inside this solution that's already got a uniform distribution of drug dose. And then we have zero flux boundary conditions on the outer boundary of the media phase, which can be like the, the boundary of your well. And in order to examine the drug delivery and its subsequent effects, we calculated the total uptake uh, or metabolism of the drug in different regions of the spheroid. Simulations are then run to the drug-free steady state, whereby all of the initial dose has been removed from the system and um, accumulated in the effective sink variable M that we defined. So two cells, red, the next few slides will represent this outer cell and blue this inner cell. Now for highly lipophilic drugs, the concentration dynamics are relatively similar between these inner and outer regions, inner blue, outer red. As the drug is able to be transported through the steroid quickly, unrestricted by permeability, there's no, no barrier effects. However, the outer cells are exposed to slightly higher concentrations and consequently more drug is metabolized in this region. It's demonstrated by similar rates of metabolism. So as you expect, there's still some gradient there. At the other end of the scale, simulations of lowly lipophilic drugs require much longer time spans in order to reach equilibrium 
due to the reduced uptake rate of the cell membranes. However, due to the intercellular transport, so the drug traveling in between the cells by diffusion, even centrally located cells receive relatively high local drug exposure and metabolize at a similar rate to outer cells. So it takes as much slower process, but potentially just as uniform as the high level case. However, these hypothetical in silico drugs of intermediate lipophilicity in this modeling scenario that exhibit the most striking discrepancies between inner and outer cells, much more metabolism occurring on the outer cells compared to the inner cells, which is because we've removed this uh, alternative delivery mechanism of going in between the cells. So this plot is looking at the total drug metabolized, uh, so similar to the other ones, the same simulations. Oh, so there's a few more here. So we've got permeability going across here from low to high, and then the total amount of drug metabolized in different parts of the steroid, so whether you're in the outer cells or the inner cells. The greatest discrepancy in drug uptake between outer and inner phosphites is revealed for those drugs of intermediate lipophilicity in the middle here. And the outer cells in the intermediate case receive the most drug out of all the scenarios, and the inner cells the least out of all the scenarios, the entire range of permeability. So how can our findings be interpreted and potentially guide experimental design? Well, to conclude firstly, we developed a mathematical model of drug transport and metabolism in a multi-scale steroid framework. The microscale processes, including membrane transport kinetics and how they relate to the physical chemical properties of the drug, as well as the macro scale features, this hepatocyte geometry, it's more realistic geometry informed by data. We studied the effects of a distinct cell based geometry and how the steady state intracellular concentration increases with lipophilicity, but the intercellular concentration is non monotonic in the model. I didn't have time to show this either, but the space between the cells further impacts the spatial temporal dynamics. So the more porous the steroid is, the more drug delivery you get. It's quite intuitive. Um, and we went up to some um, width of intercellular spaces, which is relevant for, for different uh, cell types, particularly like tumor steroids tend to be much more porous and wider intercellular gaps. Uh, but it could be a key feature because it's something that is quite difficult to quantify as we saw from our experimental data. Now, the apparent local minimum in drug penetration motivated our investigation into the uptake for the bolus dose, those last slides that we just looked at, where intermediate lipophilicity may lead to a minimal drug uptake at spheroid center. And this has a potential impact on how to dose your spheroids in vitro. Increasing the lipophilicity of your chemical doesn't necessarily mean that you'll enhance metabolism at the spheroid center during your assays. And Whilst low lipophilicity requires a longer culture time, it could be more uniform. So say you did have insufficient penetration in, in your spheroids, and you believe this is because of you were in this intermediate case where your lipophilicity was just in the wrong place. How could you remedy that if you're entering the phases of chemical design? One thing you could do is potentially increase the dose. You're not getting enough metabolism, or enough delivery to the spheroid center, increase the dose. Another thing is just change the chemical structure, throw that chemical away and develop a new one that has a different permeability, uh, a different lipophilicity, sorry. Um, another thing you could do is optimize spheroid size. If you had a smaller spheroid, these, these gradient um, spatial effects would be less of an issue and you would have more uniform exposure. The problems with these um, strategies are that if you increase the dose, Recall that in that intermediate case, your outer cells were already getting way more than in any other scenario. So you could risk um, a toxic overdose to these outer cells. If you manipulate the permeability, we've, we've shown that the model predicts is a nonlinear monotonic relationship anyway. You could end up making things worse going into a, a region of chemical space, which is uh, less desirable. And if you optimize the steroid size, that's great. But one of the key advantages of having these steroids is to in order to have these physiological gradients which are a bit more phys physiologically realistic and with smaller steroids you're removing that and going back towards the monoculture case whereby everything is uniform which you didn't want in the first place. So overall we propose using math modeling frameworks to conduct investigations, test hypotheses and guide strategy and that's what we try to show with this project that we, there's some information to be gained by having a little look on 
what what how chemical characteristics could affect things just based on simple physical processes, things like fusion of cells. So I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators and funders shown on the screen here, and colleagues from University of Liverpool, John Moores, Sheffield and AstraZeneca. I'd like to thank Rachel Baron and Steve Webb, who helped guide the project to the experience and expertise as PIs on it. Rachel's now head of department in the Master Department of Liverpool. I think most of you will know her probably from this seminar series. And Steve now also works with me in product safety in Syngenta. Um, unfortunately, no one's working on a, a direct follow-up to this work as of yet, although I think there is still interest, uh, particularly in the math department in Liverpool. But Steve and I are going to be consulting on a new NC3Rs project, which is with Rachel and Craig, Helen and Amy from Sheffield, um, which is looking on developing a model of drug delivery across the oral mucosa by a new co-adhesive patches that stick on the inside of your cheeks. So some of the same tools from this project will hopefully be applicable there. And that we can get some mass postdocs who will use this, and I might, might be able to pass on some of the some of the um, models. And this work was that I presented was published last year, so there's a lot more information that I haven't haven't given today. Um, but we published it in the Royal Society's Interface Focus. This special issue is on 3D biological cultures and organoids. It's a very interesting for these new kind of technologies that are being used in pharma and ag chem industries. Um, some of the things that I didn't have time to talk about you might be interested in are the model parameter optimization, uh, looking at a continuum version of the model and the impact of varying porosity as, as I've touched upon. I, oh, we got a lot of time, okay. So yeah, I, so that was the project and I did mention that I wanted to talk a bit about my new position. Um, I'd just like to briefly introduce the company uh, where I work and explain how the background in mathematical modeling has paved the way for this career change and emphasize how important maths can be for the agrochemical industry. So Genta's tagline is bringing plant potential to life. And this idea of increasing efficiency for crop growth is increasingly important in order to sustainably feed a rapidly growing global population while facing the more and more difficult changes of a challenging climate. Um, and Syngenta is a leading science-based agri-tech company. It's a global leader with 26,000 employees in more than 100 countries. And the aim of the company is highlighted quite nicely in the pictures at the bottom. We spend over a billion pounds a year on R&D to help farmers meet the challenges that they face today by providing them crop protection and seed products that help them increase crop yields, so more food for this ever-increasing population. But the goal of the company is that the products are not just innovative, but also sustainable. Um, carbon neutral, robust against changes in the environment, and they're safe to people in the environment. And one of the things that I really like about Syngenta is that we don't just do this research in-house, but we're very open and have a, a collaborative culture. We do a lot, uh, a lot of work with industry, uh, with academia. So, my background, as you've seen, is more of a focus on pharmaceuticals rather than plant protection products. But there are many similarities between the two when it comes to research and development. Both are chemicals which are specifically designed to bind to similar binding sites and go through similar development phases to identify hit and lead compounds and ensure that they have high affinities for their target receptors, for example. Both products often occupy a similar region of chemical space. Um, they both have specific modes of action and, and share this common research paradigm. So pharmaceuticals often reach their target following oral or, or dermal administration through the skin. And in terms of human exposure and safety for our products, we have to consider the same exposure routes too. So there's lots of overlap. However, there are also a lot of differences between ag chem research and pharma. The main obvious difference is the target species. So in pharma, you're looking at human, a single organism, whereas in plant protection, Many different species could be the target. Humans, other mammals, uh, eco-species all need to be considered. And in terms of testing to see how good a product is, uh, there's an advantage in plant protection. We can test organisms in early screens, either in vitro or in glass houses or, or in the field. Whereas in uh, pharmaceutical companies, you need to use surrogate species, for example, mice and rats. Um, and much later test the efficacy in humans when you want to get to clinical trials. 
And finally, selectivity and safety. In Palmer, there's no real selectivity challenge. There's a single target species, which is human, but this is a big issue for plant protection products. Um, typically, we need to consider human safety, crop safety, other non target organisms, uh, fish, insects, the environment, etc. So, <clears throat> predicting human safety is a big issue for us. And um, I should point out we can't test our chemicals in humans, uh, we don't do any clinical trials. So, what do we do? We use different approaches to get a mass of evidence to predict that our chemicals are safe to humans, ranging from utilizing literature, doing mathematical in vitro and in vivo testing on surrogate species like rats, etc. However, we need to consider how to perform these risk assessments without the in vivo testing. The Environmental Protection Agency, who regulate these type of chemicals in the United States, have a goal of eliminating the use of mammals in chemical testing by 2035. This puts great emphasis on the development of alternative methodologies, such as integrating uh, in silico and in vitro approaches, uh, approaches which is with the liver work, for example. So, uh, well, so you your, your sound's just gone funny on that slide again. Well, not <laughs> more funny. Okay, is it funny now? Oh, no, you're all right. I think you're just slightly too far away. That might be it. <laughs> I'm gesticulating too much. I might be hitting something. <laughs> okay. Um, Sorry, yeah, yeah. So we're putting together all these different kinds of approaches, but now we can, we're gonna have to start removing the in vivo processes. So we can't test in humans as uh, clinical trials, and we won't be able to test in surrogate species for too much longer either. Um, like I said, the, the EPA who regulate these chemicals in the United States have a goal of eliminating the use of all mammals by 2035, um, putting greater emphasis on the development of these other technologies. So, yeah, the in vitro and in silico approaches are becoming more and more important, like the liver spiroid stuff, like other types of in vitro and silico approaches, um, such as physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling. That's really important and one of the, the main things that I'm working on as well. And it's the mechanistic insights from these types of mathematical models that can be used to guide these projects, reducing the need for animal testing. So, that's why it's really important. And I think there'll be lots of opportunities for mathematical modelers to collaborate with these industries or join these industries. And okay, I'm gonna stop there for any questions, I think. And then yeah, if we have five minutes at the end, I'd just like to play a bit of music. <laughs> okay, yeah. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. Questions, um, questions if there are any about either either parts of the talk. Yeah, well, that was that was really great, and well done on on being so uh, efficient with your time as well. So, um, uh, Norman's uh, asked another question. Am I might, um, Norman, are you happy to ask it, or do you want me to read it out? I'm I'm happy to ask it. Um, Joe, I, I really enjoyed the seminar. Well done. Um, you have a slight problem with me, and that is that I've taught. The mathematics of diffusion and reaction as a chemical engineer for nearly 40 years. Um, so of course there are all sorts of questions that come up in my head uh, watching um, you, you do your presentation. Um, I, I wondered for instance whether you um, restricted the membrane transport strictly to only out to in or whether if there is a sufficient gradient in the extra uh, external fluid, whether you could actually have drug entering um, one end of a cell and leaving by the other end of the cell, if you see what I mean. Entering by one end of the cell and leaving the other cell. Well, no, in, in the um, single cell study, we, can, we assume symmetry to reduce down to this 1D problem. So yes, the the flux would be the same everywhere around the cell. Um, in the larger study, there are some regional differences, but we still have a, a reasonably symmetric um, symmetric approach whereby the drug is coming from out to in. But the membrane itself is just dependent on a local concentration gradient. So it, it can theoretically go both in and out of the membrane, but I don't think that's what you mean. Do you mean localization of for a single cell? So well, I, different I parts mean, of the same cell have different properties. Yeah, I mean, this is formally identical to the problem of getting oxygen into tumour 
tumor spheroids yeah. and um in in the right circumstances um you can have such an abrupt um oxygen concentration in the extracellular fluid mm -hmm. that one end of a cell is seeing a different oxygen concentration in the extracellular fluid to the other end of the same cell one end yeah. of the cell is stuck in oxygen rich stuff and the other end of the cell is stuck in oxygen lean um extracellular matrix now do you do you see that here and do you account for the possibility that drug could be coming into a cell where the drug concentration in the extracellular fluid is high but leaving at the other end of the cell where the extracellular um, concentration of drug is very low yeah, I think this is accounted for in the model because although on a lot of the pictures it looks like each cell has a uniform concentration, it is actually a gradient. So you can see that more clearly on the high, highly permeable case. So you can have a gradient within the cell and therefore, just as you can have the concentration either going around the cells because of those lowly permeability, it also goes through the cells. So in theory, yes, it, you could have a gradient across the length of an individual cell whereby high drug concentration is going through the cell and coming out the other end. Is that what you mean? Yeah, it is. It is. And, and well done for doing that. Um, uh, I, I absolutely love the Voronoi tessellation. Um, yeah. And um, I thought it was rather ironic that having done, shown us the Voronoi tessellation, that picture on the front cover of the journal that you showed <laughs> us <clears throat> kind of um, questioned whether Voronoi tessellation was the way to go. But I'm sure they weren't working on liver spheroids. Yes, that's that's right. Um, the, the title was quite funny <laughs> for me. For me, trying to say that this is actually uh, a good thing. I can't remember how they worded it. Yeah, I don't know how quickly I can scroll back. But the, I thought the figure was enough um, to justify it. And I think their title was just a bit more catchy because I think it's, <laughs> it's been used for so long in the field that it makes sense for them to go. Oh, maybe it's not. So the limits, the limits of applicability, um, but the limits in this paper tend to occur for cells that were much larger or smaller than these. So the, the, these, we looked at the, the range of sizes of different cells, as well as obviously you can imagine if they're not quite more closely together, then Brownite tessellation won't be relevant either. So I think we're okay, but there are there are limits. So that that was an interesting paper to point out that it shouldn't always be used, and. There are, I must say, there are experiments that you could do this with as well. That's something we struggled with. So we could look at the membranes here, but you'd have to stitch together an awful lot of images to try and um, replicate cell membranes and put them into into that lab. So we thought it was much more efficient just to go with baronite tessellation, and uh, um, our collaborators were satisfied with that anyway. So perhaps with uh, more technology, a bit more money, you, you could get something that's a bit more realistic. Uh, absolutely fantastic work. Well done. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Um, any any other questions? I I, I do have one. If if no one else uh, has one just yet, um, it, I, I was just because uh, I was thinking uh, first first question, very short one. Was those simulations three D and you just showed a two D slide? So were they two D? Three. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, we tried to go into 3D. Just for your next question, I'll, I'll show you a slide. This would have been, a, I had a bit more time, isn't it always the case on these projects, a bit more time <laughs> I'd really like to crack on with the 3D. So we did, can you, am I, not, am I still sharing? Yeah. I am, okay, yeah. So we were looking at these, um, generated some virtual steroids based on the distribution we've seen in this sample one and putting them in 3D space and then trying to get essentially a 3D Voronoi tessellation. So this is like three cells here, but the 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 coding, the algorithms for this are very difficult. It kept that overlap and it was really hard to make them work. This is an example of 3D with a regular array, for example, but we wanted to do the Voronoi approach in 3D and it's close, man. So <laughs> it can be done, but no, the ones we're looking at are 2D, but this it's like a symmetry in the, you can think about this like cylindrical coordinates. It's, it's relevant if you assume that, that that certain dimension doesn't have too much variation. So I think you could use it in certain circumstances and it's still representative of a three-dimensional situation. It's it's 2D with some cylindrical coordinates. Yeah. 
and I suppose my 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 other I thought that was the case, but yeah, I know that these three D ones are. I, I was going to be super impressed if you'd done the three D stuff because I know that's pretty horrible. Uh, the, the other quick question was: I know you, you sort of mentioned your way in your current research. You do a lot of, I guess, sort of maybe more slightly more classical pharmacokinetic modeling, mm -hmm. and I wondered if if you can sort of. I guess the idea is if you use these models to sort of add in geometry as a factor to that. So, if, you know, your pharmacokinetic models are basically zero dimensional or something. And you, you see, you can show these differences when you add in geometry of a tumor story, for example, is there, you know, can you, can you calculate a sort of, uh, you know, a factor or a population heterogeneity that, that introduces based on your, uh, based on your geometry and then alter your zero D equations when you, Yes, uh, yeah, I'm hoping there's, there's scope for that. So there's, there is a range of PK models that we use from the very simple single compartment, you know, um, to these fully physiologically based pharmacokinetic models, which look at the different flow rates and, and sizes of all these different tissues throughout the body. Um, but that's only covering the exposure for a chemical. And then when you really want to understand the hazard, what's actually happening to the chemical as it has an effect and bias to something, you, you might want a more realistic representation of the tissue. So there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't couple the two together. And that is something, yeah, I, I think is, is gonna have to be done. If we're to remove animal testing completely, you can't re rely on the pharmacokinetic models the way they are now. You need to introduce some of this tissue engineering approaches, the, these complexities from the in vitro experiments, things like organ on a chip um, in, in order to, sensibly and, and so that the model doesn't come too unwieldy do it in a targeted area so you know for example this chemical is really targeting the liver for example in this case and then you can have these kind of three-dimensional tissue models coupled there um so yeah i think it's perfectly amenable to that but it's it's not something that's routinely done at the moment but i, I think it'll need to be so you know i think that is something i'd like to bring as well because that's some of the, there are a few other modelers who have that kind of experience. So I don't see why it couldn't be done, but you would need the experimental data behind it. So that's the other thing, having, having these in vitro inputs that aren't necessarily, like say, routinely done, at least in ag chem, maybe done a bit more in pharma because they're often focused on, on human tissues as well, but we'd have to consider them for, for multiple species. So it's whether you'd be able to get, get that data or at least something you can read across with. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Oh, thanks, uh, Igor. Yeah, I think you know, again, brilliant talk, and I think probably my question was already answered, if not fully, but partially. So th then you consider the Voronoi tessellation. Effectively, in two D, you did a projection, so you, because it's 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 a cross section. Mm -hmm. Is it possibility to do something in between, like two and a half dimension, where you take into account the curvature, and still have a slightly more kind of, some information preserved from three D, but without doing full three D model? So is it possible to do it in some curved manifold rather than on full 3D? Just got to code in spherical coordinates. That's not <laughs> I don't know. I'd probably have to collaborate with someone like yourself. Do you have some ideas? It sounds like you have an idea already how, how this might work. But um, yeah, to be honest, I, I don't know if it could be done. It, why not? We, this is the, the thing we had here, which is still very polygonal and very complex. Um, I can't say I've done anything in, in two and a half D before. But yeah, do you have any ideas you want to propose? I think the, the vertex dynamics people um, who um, end up with something that looks like Voronoi tessellation, but they start with the um, elasticity of the extracellular matrix and the um, contact between cell surfaces, and they allow it to dynamically grow. And, and as it grows, it minimizes the free energy stored in the, um, in the strain. Um, and that is quite challenging to do in 2D, but I believe has now been done in 3D. Um, and there's um, an embryology, a sort of theoretical embryology literature that's built up around that one. That's the nearest I've seen people get. Um, if anyone is uh, fancying coding that for the, from scratch, it's, um, well, it was 10 years work to get the 2D version going in Oxford. Right, okay, yeah. Is, was that using um, Chase, does it? That's the Oxford program. They've done some 3D modeling of cells in. I don't know no, if they have to dynamically develop in um, cell membranes, though, aren't 
Um, I, I think one of the early PhD students is now a senior lecturer at the University of Sheffield, and I believe he is still very active in this area. Alex Fletcher, is it? Now, I was really afraid you'd ask that because <laughs> he Sorry. gave a seminar in this series about what two and a half, three years ago, one of the very early ones um, in this yeah. series. And I've completely forgotten his name and I've been meaning to email him for a while as well. <laughs> um, so I really apologize. But if you go back into the excellent archive that you guys um, keep of these seminars, I'm sure. You, it will stick out like a sore thumb. There's, there are also, there's at least one person working on vertex dynamics in the maths department at Manchester as well, isn't there? Oh, excellent, because yeah, I think that would take this really to the, another level. It is a simplification that's well spotted. Um, because it, it does assume some symmetry, symmetry in the Z direction. So 3D, full 3D. Yeah, it would make it even better and some beautiful pictures, I'm sure. I realise you you had another video to show us, but we've uh, we've we've had it. We've kept uh, questioning you. It's a. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I'm happy if you wanna if you wanna share it now. We still have time. People can obviously people can can drop out if they have to go, um, unless anyone else has any other questions for Joe. Okay. You can always contact me afterwards. Um, I don't know if I mentioned my email, but Carl, Carl can give it you as well. <laughs> but yeah, I was hoping to play, play some exit music anyway, so it's quite fitting that it would go at the end. <laughs> so was, was this this pro, this was this project, this collaborative project, right, between... Oh, yeah, you've got it then. Yeah, yeah, it's here. So, um, you know, if people do have to drop out, that's fine. I, I also have to go fairly soon. Um, my screen's still shared. I keep forgetting that. God knows what I've been doing. Um, <laughs> but I'd just like to end by mentioning really interesting collaboration related to the LCMH liver throw project um, that came out of PRISM, which is an interdisciplinary research centre at the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester. Um, PRISM focused on, oops, sorry about that, focused on promoting creative collaboration between science and music. Um, Rachel and I met with an uh, RNCM PhD student, Anna Appleby. She's studying composition, and we discussed the research in this project such that she could write um, a, a new score, translating some of our results uh, into a musical figure. And it's quite interesting the way she used some of the figures themselves and, and implemented them into the score, things like this discrete discretization of the cellular space versus the more, more continuous stuff, and developed a jazz trio piece entitled Uptake. Uh, it was actually supposed to be being performed last year. Being forward, so this is an old slide. So, yeah, it's supposed to be in, in Manchester and Liverpool, actually. Um, unfortunately, that couldn't happen, but it has since been recorded by Riot Ensemble this past summer and promoted and uploaded to YouTube. So I'm going to try and share that with you now for the last couple of minutes. It's pretty cool, very abstract. Um, there for now but it is on youtube if you want to uh want to see the rest of it quite interesting isn't it i hope you could uh, imagine some of my figures in there <laughs>
but if not, it was really fun to be involved with. It's, it's not often you get to collaborate with people from the arts and science. So yeah, yeah, it was lots of fun. Um, thanks everyone for your attention today.